wants to start us off that what they learned. Oh. What I learned from Monica, Monica already took the floor this morning, she's from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now she says, we have an agribusiness program called Two Scale, and Two Scale is in the 15 Dutch partner countries is supporting agribusiness entrepreneurs. Now the obvious question is, how successful are you with empowering women? And she said, well, we still have a long way to go, because the objective is going into 40%, and now after a review, they are reaching maybe 36%, but they have to know now in detail what does it mean. But we talked about mechanized processing, because there are some false assumptions here. The first assumption is that mechanized processing will keep women out of a job, which is not per se true, on the contrary. And then another concern was, and Monique spoke about an experience of 35 years ago where she has the impression donors are still insensitive about it, which is we tend to organize activities for women disregarding their social activities and one of the basics is seasonal availability. When in every country, and she was talking about Zimbabwe, there, is, there are a number of months where, peop, where women are less active make sure you organize your activities during that specific period, then they are available. It's, it cannot be used as an excuse. So two points, mechanized processing for women, and then the second about make sure donors are sensitive for seasonal availability of women. Thank you. Over here. This is uh, Paul Vasjur from the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Netherlands. I was talking to Asa, wasn't it? Camilla. Camilla, sorry, to Myrna. And we said, you said, what are we going to do? And the end of the day is, if you keep talking, let's say, on a governmental level, you will stay into a mode where there is not really the action you require. In order to do so, you need to go down to the field level and say, what is it what we can actually do on the ground? And you need to include women because they know what they need and they know what they want. So by making this inclusive and making small steps, and much has to be done, if you're able to make small steps, and we know that many small steps make big leaps, is there where you need to start including. So we need to get down from the government level, down to, let's say, the, 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 the grassroots areas, and see what are the possible and feasible steps we could make on the ground. Because you make the steps too big, you fall over. It's not possible. So make small steps and involve women. And I also believe that we should not be Sometimes you hear we know that what people need, but I mean involve those women directly from the start. Pass and then mm -hmm. Mark, then over here, then over here, and then over there, and then we're going to let Jayati uh, sum up. Sum up. Okay. Please, play this first. Okay. Mark Holden is from the Global Forum on Agriculture Research. Um, we were kicking around these issues of, of how to make sure that it's not going to be gender blocked as we go forward or gender reversed. Um, and a few key points. First off, think about how are we, what questions are we asking? Are our questions gender blind? Because if they are, they're not going to be gender neutral. That's one essential start. If we start looking at agriculture, for example, in productivity terms alone, we're capturing the men's issues, not what women are most passionate and caring about, about change needed in energy saving, time saving, nutrition in the household and so on, and value addition post-harvest. So we've skewed our questions in the first place by thinking in a very traditional, frankly, green revolution sense. We haven't come to a new understanding of, of what values are we looking for. And alongside that is changing the metrics because we're still using very simplistic metrics about production, productivity, very poor metrics about social change and, and impacts and value systems there. Um, thirdly, I think start from gender, not start from women, was a very important point. Thinking about some work we did in Bangladesh a few years ago, if you start with seed systems there, the men naturally say, okay, we want to know, we're the ones who you should be talking to, you can't talk to the women. Within a season, they were saying, but this is women's work. By the second season, the women were saying, hey, this is tremendous economic opportunity. And the men and the women were saying, great, we can become seed traders. 
So you have to, I think, work, as you said earlier, with the household, not just with the women in the household, and bring value for both sides of that. And finally, the, the big issue of knowledge access and breaking through the engendered barriers to, to women actually benefiting, or young people benefiting, come to that. Mobile phones offer huge potential to cut right through the traditional power relationships because the women now have the phones in, in most, certainly, sub-Saharan Africa. They're empowered by that and they can be reached direct by that instead of through an intermediary. And that creates huge opportunity to bring not just knowledge, but all the associated services, microfinance, microinsurance, right through to the women in the household. Thank you. My name is Esther Infotabo. I work with um, the NEPAD agency. And thanks for um, the very an interesting um, keynote address. Um, just three points in terms of um, sustainability, because that's what we are looking at here, with how to avoid reversal of actions that have been undertaken um, from a project point of view. I think a couple of issues have already been raised. Um, we really should um, look at the issue of planning at different levels. And I, I think the emphasis really here is going down to territories, going down to spaces where you can have the gender issues of both men and women involved in the planning and in the decision that they want to make. In that, in that, in that, in that um, way, you have the issue that my sister from Malawi just mentioned, where the women will not be afraid to go and tell their husband we are doing this. But they are working in the context where they have jointly planned and um, where you have used authorities at different levels to be able to ensure that beyond the life of a project, the communities have bought it into it and they have the authority of their traditional leadership to be able to continue in the efforts that they have agreed to do. I think, um, secondly, we, we do see the international community, the donors, changing their agendas ever so often. I think we need long-term commitment to actions that we agree to support. And I just want to make the point, going back to your first question, I would rather think it's not about what the development partners want in terms of our priorities, but how the development partners are supporting the priorities that the member states or the countries have decided for themselves. Because in that way, you can get sustainability. It's embedded in the policy, in the national development strategies of these countries. And so even when the support through program or budget aid leaves, the government themselves are committed to taking those actions forward. So governance is important, governance at all levels and long-term commitment from the development partners to engage with the developing countries to, pro to, to, to move ahead their agenda. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I was talking to one more, but I'm going to hold you to short. I will be very short. Um, you, you, you talked about uh, the importance of cooperatives, and we mean uh, lead at cooperatives or included in cooperatives. So uh, my point is gender equality. So let's also use this. Um, in most of the African countries, we have producer organizations and properties which are mixed, okay, men and women. And what we 
also, uh, sorry, my name is Carol Pelpa <laughs> from FAO. Um, what we saw in, uh, in Asia in a study that we did for in uh, producer organizations is that yes, there are a lot of women in producer organizations and corporates. But what are their role in terms of decision making and leadership? Very good. So this is about uh, how we, I mean, how we need to act in order to make sure that yes, they are empowered, but there are also gender equality. So, um, so negotiation skills, leadership skills, but also internal governance. We saw that the internal governance of uh, POs and cooperatives are very. There is a lot of problems. So let's also include this into the discussion. And remember, you'll have 30 minutes to keep talking about this well you consume lovely Italian cafe. <laughs> Will you please give us your final thoughts? Yeah, thank you. You know, I want to also just mention, I was talking to, um, I didn't get your name, I'm sorry, but he mentioned the point about biodiversity. And I was hoping he would also raise it just now. And I think it's very important that, that you know, uh, what we also don't often recognize is that Many of the custodians of the biodiverse resources that we have today are, happen to be women in traditional communities. And many of those are being not just wiped out and eradicated by the growth of, you know, certain single crop kinds of things like he mentioned the banana. Uh, one kind of banana that is genuinely traded, or even quinoa. Apparently, there's only one form of quinoa which is now the fashionable in product, right, for healthy living. Uh, so all the other 200 varieties get wiped out. What we need to do is to actually show that there are business opportunities for these varieties and to promote those varieties, which would necessarily, in fact, empower the women who have been the guardians and custodians of those varieties, but which are increasingly getting wiped out. The question is how to make that business opportunity viable. And a lot of that Again, I think it's, it's not just the local demand, because local demand is increasingly influenced by, you know, we have no idea. I mean, there are, there are villagers all over the world watching American TV serials and, you know, getting their patterns of consumption from that and so on. So we have to actually think of influencing demand at the local level, which necessarily means intervening at the global level. I mean, quinoa is back in fashion among the peasants who derided it as an inferior grain because they see all these people in, in you know, fancy hotels, etc., having it as well. So uh, there is a, there's a complicated way in which we necessarily have to bring back diversity. I think Italy is a wonderful place to begin because, you know, the slow food movement or in general, you celebrate the local and it's part of your culture that, you know, okay, the, the, the asparagus from so-and-so region at this season and so on. Whereas we have stopped emphasizing, I don't know, the, the local vegetable that is, used to be very famous when I was a child in a particular part of North India. But we have to go back to celebrating those things which would in turn generate both diverse, biodiversity and women's empowerment. But I think, you know, there is this thing, this theme which is coming through and I, by the way, one point I just want to clarify, I am not at all against mechanization, I'm all for it. Anything that reduces human drudgery, labor saving, yes, bring it on, okay? What I am against is organizational forms that throw people out of employment. And that's not technology, that's organization. So I'm all for technologically, you know, advanced, and imp that's why I would say pr cooperatives that promote uh, also, the labor-saving devices are, are definitely uh, to be preferred. No, the final point, which is, you know, and I think it came out very beautifully in what you said, that y y the men shouldn't feel threatened and antagonized and excluded from a process of women's empowerment, that it has to be, you know, combined. And the only way it will be sustainable is if men and women both see that there's something in it for them. And not just that women feel that, yes, it's good, but that the house, that everybody in that society feels. Now that's a very tough one because yes, power relations are threatened. And yes, power relations are pervasive, as you said, that when you have you know, cooperatives with men and women, surprise, surprise, the women are not in the position you know, of making decisions and so on. And that's like practically every other institution we know in the world. So, you know, in the European Union, you now have reservation for women on boards because otherwise 
guess what? They don't get onto boards of companies. And so this is a big, and I would say it's not insoluble, but it's a tough problem. But I, it does mean that you have to tread this fine line between strategies that are focused only on women and therefore can end up alienating especially younger men. And I think that's a very big point that has come back again and again. Mariana also raised it. That, you know, the youth feel increasingly excluded, alienated, deprived from this system, and young men in particular. So you have to ensure that they're also on board, that they see that this is something that involves them. At the same time, the intervention has to be something that because it's, as you, someone mentioned, that you know, gender blind is definitely not gender neutral. It has to therefore be creative enough and flexible enough to actually make women clear beneficiaries of it. It's a very tough call and it means that it can't be one solution in each place and in each time and it has to be locally specific. But I think, you know, for me what is really encouraging is to see that all of you are, um, are very aware of these things. So it gives me hope that in fact in, in both donor policy and in interventions that these kinds of things will be definitely in your minds when you're designing both, you know, the aid programs and advising on policy. So for me, that's very encouraging. So let's give a huge round of applause.